Thank you for listening to Crossroads Community Church. At Crossroads, our mission is to be the church by exalting the glory of God, sharing and showing the love of Christ, and inviting others to be recipients of Christ's love. Now here's this week's message. This morning we're starting a, uh, a brand new series where we're going to dig into and talk a lot about the topic of faith. But before we get into that, uh, let me just ask this. How many people have ever prayed for something for like a really, 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 really long time? Anyone? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and when we're praying for something for a long time, it can feel like it takes forever, uh, mostly because when we pray for things or when we want things in general, when do we want them? We want them now, right? So how many people, let me ask this, how many people have ever prayed for a spouse, uh, not, I mean, to get a spouse, not to get rid of one, but pray for a spouse? Yeah, uh, I, I know uh, lots of people who have. Uh, there are people who have prayed for healing, for a family member to be healed, uh, for a sick one. Uh, we in the band, Patty wasn't feeling good this morning, so we spent some time uh, praying for her. Is there anyone who's prayed for like a, a job situation or a financial situation? Yeah, I know. Rob has, and I shared many times of, you know, when I went uh, without work, and I know if I actually go back and look, it was probably a short time, but it felt like at least a year to me. I know it wasn't a full year, but it felt like it, it was a full year. I mean, house almost re um, foreclosed on, car repossessed almost multiple times, just all kind of different situations, and praying through that felt like forever. And especially if, how many of you prayed for a family member or a friend to come to know know the Lord and, and, and pray for family members to get saved. Yeah, it can be feel like you've prayed forever. And I know specifically my, my mother, don't know how long, it's probably years that she was praying for me to uh, become a Christian and probably still prays for me, uh, hopefully does. Uh, but when we pray for something, it can feel like, especially when it doesn't come to fruition, it can feel like when, when we keep praying and, and it, time goes on and it turns into days or weeks or months or years, if you've ever prayed for something for years, uh, it can feel like, wow, your faith kind of gets a little bit weaker. Am I the only one that feels like it? Like your, it feels like your faith is being tested. Maybe you feel like God's not hearing me. Maybe I'm not doing what God wants me to do. And you feel a little bit challenged in responding to God's call the next time God says, hey, I got something for you to do. Now, here's the truth. We won't be the first people, and we definitely won't be the last people who have ever prayed for something to happen, and either it didn't happen or we felt like, wow, we totally got this wrong. Uh, before we jump into, I'm going to ask you to turn to the book of Hebrews. So if you have a Bible, take that out. But before we jump into that, uh, I'm going to show you a couple of verses um, from Matthew. Now, this is from Matthew chapter 17, and this is what uh, it says. And when they, meaning Jesus and his disciples, they approached the multitude, a man came up to him, kneeling before him and saying, Lord, do pity and have mercy on my son, for he has epilepsy, is moonstruck, and he suffers terribly. And the reason they say moonstruck is because the, the belief that, you know, the epileptic seizures were tied to the phases of the moon. I don't know if that was, they're confusing that with lichenism and all that. Google lichenism, pretty cool. But he suffers terribly, for frequently he falls into the fire and many times into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they were not able to cure him. So here's the situation. They came upon uh, someone, and the disciples had been trying to cure this person who had had epileptic seizures and fits, and they couldn't cure him. So um, they came to Jesus and said, hey, I brought him to your disciples. They couldn't do anything. And Jesus answered, oh, you unbelieving, warped, wayward, rebellious, and thoroughly perverse generation. How long am I to remain with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was cured instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus and asked privately, why could we not drive it out? Now, here's, here's what happened. They, they saw a situation where uh, the result was there was these actions and seizures uh, uh, of this person, and so they tried to cure it. They tried to heal it. And then Jesus came along, and he actually drove out a demon. So the cause was a demon. Now, that's not to say that every time someone has fits or mental illness or situations like that, that it's caused by a demon. That's not to say that's always the case. And it's not to say that every time that a demon possesses someone that they have those symptoms. But in this instance, 
uh, Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was cured instantly. Now, of course, if you're one of the disciples, you would ask the same question that they did. They said, hey, how come we couldn't drive it out? And his response, verse 20, he said to them, because of the littleness of your faith, that is your lack of firmly relying trust. For truly, I say to you, if you have faith that is living like a grain of mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to yonder place, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. So what Jesus is telling them, they're saying, hey, uh, we had this situation. We tried to, to, to heal this person, drive out the demon. We couldn't do it. Jesus did it, and they said, hey, why couldn't we do it? And Jesus said, you don't have faith enough to do it. And that wouldn't be a big problem, except that just a few chapters prior to that, Jesus gave them the power and the authority to drive out the demons. In uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, and Jesus summoned to him his 12 disciples and gave them power and authority over unclean spirits to drive them out, to cure all kinds of disease and all kinds of weakness and infirmity. So they didn't have an issue with, we don't have the power that you have, Jesus. We don't have the authority that you have, Jesus. That's why we couldn't do it. Jesus said, hey, you don't have the faith to do it. Now, now here's, here's, here's a couple of realities, all right? Uh, Jesus tells us, this is what we read in the Bible, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in us. If you've stepped across that line of faith and trusting and believing in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, uh, then we're told in the Bible in multiple places that he puts his promised seal of the Holy Spirit into us so that we know that we are his and he knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are his. Right? So he gives us that same spirit. Uh, it also tells us in the Bible that we'll do greater things than the miracles Jesus performed. Right? And I'm not trying to over-spiritualize this, but think about this. We have the power and authority to do the same things that Jesus did. But do we have the faith to do the things that Jesus did? Now, here's the thing. I don't want to be one of those Christians that says, uh, the reasons, Christians, we aren't seeing more miracles to do uh, today is because Christians don't have faith, right? You hear that a lot. I'm not saying that's a root cause of everything. But I do want to be one of those Christians who reads the Bible and sees where Jesus said that certain things that we're not able to do, he gives us power to do it, he gives us authority to do it, but we just may not have the faith to do it. Now, um, think about this, okay? Because faith uh, is a spiritual thing, okay? It's manifested in the physical world. All right, bear with me for a minute, okay? God, who is a spirit, when we step across the line of faith, he takes his spirit and puts it into those of us, we're human, flesh and blood. And now we have the power and the authority to do spiritual things in the physical world because of God's power in us, all right? Not trying to over-spiritualize this, but that's, that's a fact, it's a truth, it's a biblical truth. Now, the same 12, well, not all 12, but the same apostles who couldn't do anything because they didn't have faith, once they saw the resurrected Jesus, they went out and turned the world upside down by doing all kinds of things, all kinds of miracles, healing people, raising the dead, um, um, curing the blind, all kinds of things because their faith was changed. So we're going to spend a little bit of time, um, actually not a little bit of time, we're going to spend a whole lot of time over the next couple of weeks talking about faith, understanding what it means when we use that word, understanding what faith is, understanding how it impacts our relationship with Jesus, how it impacts our relationship with others, how it impacts us as a congregation, how it impacts the church in the world today, all, all this kind of stuff we're going to dig into. Uh, we're going to actually put our faith into action. We're going to do some things here on Sunday morning that's going to challenge us to take a step of faith, and we're going to share our faith. Now, I realize, because a lot of times when I say, now go do this or go do that, once we get home and throughout the week, by the end of the day, or, or, or once we're with the kids or whatever, or in Christy and I's case, when we get home and we're dealing with the puppy and the dogs and all that stuff, your mind's not on, ooh, let me take this, this nugget I got from the message and, and apply it. So while we're all here on some of these Sunday mornings throughout the summer, we're going to take some actions that are going to allow you guys to uh, share your faith, all right? But first, 
we need to understand what faith is. So um, if you have a Bible, open it up to the book of Hebrews chapter 11, uh, and it's called, for some of you might know this, it's called the Hall of Faith. How many people have read Hebrews chapter 11? So here, here's what we're going to do. Uh, many of you have read it. We're going to, and when I've read it, I've read it, I don't know how many times. I usually read right through. I stop at some things. I look at some things. But we're actually going to dig into it and look at the lives of the people who were mentioned, how their lives were changed, how their faith was challenged, how they persevered, what, what, what did they do or what things they didn't do, and how God used them and transformed their lives uh, because of their faith. So turn to um, Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to start, start right off in verse 1. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, and if you don't have a Bible, there should be one somewhere around you, left or right, under the chair, in front of you, or behind you. And if not, raise your hand, we'll have someone bring, bring one to you. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Now, before we dig into this, uh, just to understand the definition of faith, the author of Hebrews says, and we'll get into a little bit more about the background of the whole book of Hebrews um, next week, but the author of Hebrews says that faith is being sure of what we hope for, even though we don't see it, okay? And a lot of people, you know, if you've ever been a Christian in an environment amongst non-Christians, there can be a lot of criticism because you're putting your faith and what they call blind faith in something that you don't see, something that you can't touch. There's this invisible spiritual God who we put our faith in. A lot of people will say that Christians or religion in general is just made up to explain the things that we don't understand and we can't see. That's not what the author is saying. He's saying that we're putting our hope and faith in something we don't see, but we're absolutely sure of it. Now, how many of you have ever had a job before? Anyone? Hopefully all of us who pay bills, right? So um, when, when I uh, got out of the military, my first adult job after the military, uh, I went for an interview. And when I went to the interview, it was a great interview. I did a good job. Who could expect anything less? But um, they said, you know, pretty much the job is yours. See you on Monday. Show up, and we'll, we'll get you all squared away. Now, they didn't give me anything to put in my hands to say, you have this job. But I showed up on Monday because I was believing that I had the job. Now, I knew that I was going to have to, when I got there, I was going to have to fill out paperwork and all this stuff. But that, that's kind of like faith. I showed up because someone told me, this is what's going to happen and I believed it, and I acted on it. That's what faith is. God said, here is what has happened, and here is what's going to happen, and then faith is us believing it and moving ourselves in our lives based on what God has said. Now, James, in the book of James, adds a little bit more to that. He says this. Uh, James says in verse Chapter 2, verse 14, he said, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? And he's not saying that, you know, uh, when we put our faith in God that we have to do deeds in order to get in right standing with God. He's saying if you have faith, then there should be physical evidence of your faith in your relationship with God. And uh, one of the people at the, uh, the, the conference yesterday, a man-up conference, I forget which one said it, uh, he said that a Christian man, or woman, but a Christian man should be different than every other man on the planet. If you have the spirit of God living in you, doesn't matter what people say about you, doesn't matter what they're not saying about you, doesn't matter what they believe about you, you should be different because you have God's spirit in you. And so what James is saying is, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. So for this, we're going to take this in Hebrews, and our working definition for this series is this. Faith is being sure and certain of what God is doing or will do in one's life and acting on that knowledge 
living one's life in a way that reflects their faith regularly and consistently, even when there is no evidence of God at work. Does, does that make sense to everyone? Here, here's, let's do this. If you read, um, on, on the count of three, just the red words, we're going to read this together. On the count of three, just the red words, you get a, the, a working, very hardcore understanding of what faith is. Ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Being sure and certain of what God is doing and acting on that knowledge even when there is no evidence. That's what faith is. That is the basic bottom line understanding from a biblical concept uh, of what faith is. All right, so now here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk a little bit about the people that we're reading about. So jump back to the book of Hebrews. And in verse 3, this is what we read. By faith... We understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks even though he is dead. So let's talk a little bit about Abel's faith, because that's, that's what we want to do, is dig down into these people, what they did, how their lives uh, interacted, what can we learn from them that's going to help us and encourage us in our faith. Uh, the first thing that the author of Hebrews tells us about Abel's faith is Abel's faith was put into action. The offering that he made, it says that he brought by faith. Now, we can argue all day about who brought the better offering or why they brought different offerings. And there are lots of theories out there about why, you know, Cain brought vegetables and Abel brought meat. I mean, the most common and basic understanding is meat is always better than vegetables. That's not a theological concept. That's just my opinion. But we can argue about that all day. But his faith was put into action. And uh, it could be you know, a lot of theories about because they were, you know, brothers and sisters. Anyone have siblings? Yeah, anyone have sibling rivalries with your brothers and sisters? Yeah, it's, it's okay to, to try to one-up a brother or sister. Um, it's okay to try to bring a better gift to mom and dad or bring a better, you know, meal to the family cookout. Um, it's not okay to beat your brother or sister to death with a rock, which is what happened with Cain and Abel. But it could have been the sibling rivalry. It doesn't tell us why, but it does tell us that Abel's gift was offered. He brought it as an act of faith. And then just a few verses down, this is what it says about faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So Abel's gift was authored as an act of faith. And when he put his faith into action, it pleased God. Uh, it also tells us that his faith made him righteous. Now, it's not it's not in the same way that someone is made in right standing with God today. Back then, and this is even before the law, but the understanding was that in order to be in right standing with God because of our sin, uh, the penalty of sin is death, so something had to die. So an animal was sacrificed, and that animal sacrificed, that death, atoned for or took the place of a human's sin, which was deserving of death, their separation from God. Today, instead of doing that, we don't have to have a you know, slaughter an animal. We just have to accept the one eternal sacrifice that was made when Jesus Christ, as the Lamb of God, took all of our sins upon him and died in our place. And instead of us bringing a sacrifice, all we have to do is accept that that sacrifice paid the penalty for our sins. And when we accept it, then God says, yeah, you know what? You are now declared in right standing with me, and he puts his Holy Spirit in us uh, to seal our relationship with him. So in that essence, he was made righteous, uh, but it also says that his faith testifies to this day. We're reading about it. We're talking about it now. And Jesus even talked about it because uh, in Luke chapter 11, this is what we read. Therefore, and he's talking to the people of Israel, he says, therefore, also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they kill and persecute so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, 
who perish between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. Now, the reason it was required of this generation is because the Israelites were the people from whom God would have prophets come and declare to the world the truth of God's word. The Israelites were also the people who were supposed to maintain the accuracy of God's word. And Jesus tells us somewhere else that all of the prophets and all of the Old Testament pointed to him. And so the people who were supposed to maintain the word about the prophets that point to Jesus, when Jesus showed up and said, here I am, they rejected him and they refused to hear him and refused to acknowledge him. And so he says, yeah, you guys are going to be held responsible. But he also says the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world and the first blood of a prophet, he mentions, is Abel, which would help us kind of understand why Abel, before the law, would bring a, a, a meat and fat portion sacrifice as an offering to God. It's because he had already been spending time with God, talking to God, hearing from God, and telling others about God. So here's, here's, here's the final thing that, that, that the book doesn't actually tell us this, but yeah, his faith was put into action. His faith made him righteous. His faith testifies to this day. But his faith also cost him his life. His faith is what led him to bring that particular offering. And because of that, his brother killed him. And there are things that we do today because of our faith where all we end up with is someone slamming us on Facebook or sending a bad tweet about us or talking bad about us at work. Yet we have missionaries that we support here that are in countries where it's not, if, if, if they go public with their sharing of the gospel, they're not just going to get slammed on Facebook. They're going to get killed. And if you guys, I can't, I won't mention her name now, but um, one of the families we support, we shared this a while back, they were sending out prayer requests because they were filling up rooms like this in the Middle East with people sharing the gospel, and then their pictures appeared on the news as criminals of the state because they were sharing the gospel, and they were being hunted. As far as I know, they're still okay from my last communication with them. But that's the risk of living out your faith. And there are people, we tend to think, well, this is Old Testament. There's no one today who's going to get killed or beheaded or shot or hung or lose their job or ostracized because they go and say, I'm a Christian and I love the Lord. But at least once or twice a month when you turn on the news, if not more frequently, because I try not to watch the news too much, specifically because of this, you hear about people, some all around the world, but every now and then there's some in our nation who are criticized, who are ostracized. Most of the beheadings are overseas and the killings are overseas because of people who come out and say, I love the Lord. But that's the risk that we take to share our faith. Now, I want to close with a, this passage of scripture from the end of this chapter, uh, and then I'm going to issue a little challenge to us. So um, turn back to Hebrews 11, but go down to the end of the chapter, verse 32. And this is what the author of Hebrews tells us in verse 32. He says, and what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith, they conquered kingdoms. And we, we struggle today in this country and in other countries like, hey, you know what, politics and, and the governments and all this stuff. But what they did was they put their faith and their trust in the word of God, who conquered kingdoms, who administered justice and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. 
The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground, meaning they were homeless, basically. And these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. And today, when we leave and go out into the public, we're, we're afraid to take a stand. Not that we're supposed to bash the things of the culture, but we're supposed to stand up for the things of God. And I want to share with you this picture as, as the band comes up before we uh, close out in this last song. I want to share with you this picture before anyone says anything. Yes, it's from a comic book, all right? But it's also from a movie. It's, it's one of these awesome quotes, uh, and I just love it. It's from a, a comic book series. Uh, how many people have heard of Captain America? Okay, a comic book series called Civil War, which I think it was 2006, 2007. It was a year-long comic book series where, you know, People were fighting against one another and arguing against one another because the government said the superheroes had to do this, and the superheroes said no, and then superheroes all took a side, and they were fighting against one another. And one of the most iconic, awesome um, pictures from that comic book series, the quote made its way into the movie, and this is the quote from Captain America, and he says, it doesn't matter what the press says, it doesn't matter what the politicians or the mob say, it doesn't matter if the whole country decides that something is wrong, is right. This nation was founded on one principle above all else, the requirement that we stand up for what we believe, no matter the odds or the consequences. When the mob and the press and the whole world tell you to move, your job is to plant yourself like a tree beside the river of truth and tell the whole world, no, you move. And if you're a Christ follower, it doesn't matter what the culture tells you, what the government tells you, it doesn't matter what, 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 what the people at work are telling you, the people on Facebook are telling you, our job is to stand up for the word of Christ and do what God has called us to do. So I'm going to ask you guys to stand and Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you guys to do a little challenge. Some of you, this may, may not work for all of you. Uh, but how many people have a smartphone? Yeah. If you have a smartphone, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to just take a step of faith. And you're going to say, well, how does this work? This isn't really challenging my faith. Uh, hear me out. I'm going to ask you to take a step of faith and take out your smartphone and check into this church. And it's basically letting people know who look at your Facebook status, whatever, that, hey, you're at church on Sunday morning. And most of us don't do that every Sunday morning. There are people that know we go to church. There are a lot of people that don't. And you can, you know, I, I put up the hashtag, thank God for my siblings, because we're talking about Cain and Abel, uh, even though, you know, my sister's not that fond of me. Uh, and I put the hashtag, that's what faith can do. But even that little thing of just checking in somewhere and saying, hey, I'm, it's Sunday morning, I'm at church. You don't have to put on praising God or whatever. Uh, there will be, and I've, I've heard stories about people, there will be people who say, hey, I never knew that you went to church. Or tell me about that church. Or are you a Christian? And it gives you the opportunity to share your faith. So I'm going to ask you guys to stand. And God, we just pray that we would be true to who you have called us to be to be your church, to be your people, that your spirit would guide us and lead us and that we would stand together, not to fight against the culture, not to fight against the government, but to stand up for your word and your truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.